This is Advent. Again, Advent, ad Adventus, the adventure of God leaving heaven, becoming a man. Becoming a man. It's literally the story of God with us. Would you turn to your neighbor or behind you or wherever and say, God is with me. God is with me. We know he's with you because he lives within you. That's what the word says. Probably preach on that during this series, but not today. What does every person have but a longing in their heart? What would you give to have somebody walk through life with you? Give you all the wisdom you needed for the tough times. Comfort you when the bad times come. Strengthen you. Encourage you. Be a friend. A lover of your soul. Who was always there. Who never left you. What would you give for that? That's the story of the Advent. That's God, your maker, coming to live with you every single moment of every day. God with you. Proverbs 18, 24, the second part says, those who would be a friend must first be Friendly, And then it goes on to say, we can come back to that a little later, but it goes on to say, and there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Who is that friend? Do you know, every human being will disappoint you. Hello, come on. As I do what I know I'm supposed to do to take care of my wife, to get her through this process of, uh, of not being able to do anything for herself, I am acutely aware of the fact, and I confess it to you, that I'm failing some of you, and I know that. And it tears me up not to be at your homes with you always. And at times I feel like, you know, Lord, I'm failing them. And the response I get back from God is, Gordon, <laughs> they have a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and he's a whole lot better than you are. <laughs> he never leaves them. He never forsakes them. And that's my son, Jesus. I'm his representative, but I'm human. And sometimes I'm going to fail you. You're at times going to fail each other. Whew. Praise God. He never fails us. He never fails us. He, he's that friend that sticks closer than a brother. What is the promise from the word? Matthew chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel of, of Matthew. says, And it's a quote, by the way. You can see it's a quote from Isaiah 7.14 where God said to Israel in the middle of the Old Testament, Behold, look, our word for today is aware. Be aware. And that means, whoa, I'm really aware of the fact that there is a virgin who will come and she will be what? There's that word, with. God with you. Mary would be with child. And the child, whose name is Jesus, will be with Mary. And who's that child? God. Imagine for just a moment. I'm, I'm watching the pregnant ladies. I, in our church, and, and it's amazing. One of the most joyous times with my wife was just watching the pregnancy develop and then being there for the last four as, as our children were uh, delivered. 
and the pure joy of that pregnancy in the midst of pain, uh, you know, in the midst of pain, the joy of the pregnancy. Imagine what Mary felt. Not only being pregnant, she was pregnant with God. Was she not? No, I'm, I'm not taking this to, you know, the improper theological conclusion. Understand. But was Jesus 100% God and 100% man as he walked this earth? Yes, he was. Theologians uh, refer to him as the dual nature. He had the hypostatic union of God and man, 100%. And there, in her womb, God was with her, and God began to be with us. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name. You've been wanting to shout it out for half an hour. Go ahead and say it. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And what is Emmanuel? You've been, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. You got the Christmas spirit. I, yep, you got it. What does Emmanuel mean being interpreted? God? God with us. God with us. The friend that sticks closer than a brother. Don't raise your hand. Don't tell me about it. But think about, what are you going through? Is it a new move? Is it a physical illness? Is it a relational difficulty? Is it a financial issue? Uh, is it loneliness? What is it? It's a lot of little molehills that I blow up in the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> but, but when he's there, kind of, and I walk with him, and I'm faithful where he's at. Yeah. <laughs> Do you turn your mountains into molehills? Now nah, you're the only one who does that. Yeah. <laughs> or molehills into mountains, excuse me. But no, you're not the only one. I was teasing you. God is with us no matter what you're going through. You are never alone as a believer. You may feel like you're alone, but you are never alone. The peace of God, the joy of God, the wisdom of God, the comfort of God. And all that God is, is there in the midst with you. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. Book of Hebrews, chapter 1, it opens with the writer of Hebrews saying to us long ago, and literally throughout all of the Old Testament is what he's referring to, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to the Old Testament people. He did. God came down and spoke in many times and, and in many ways to the Old Testament people. He spoke through the universe. God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Think about that. We've shared with you before the stars are themselves a manuscript about the grace of God. Virgo, the virgin, speaks of Mary. And, and in each of the quadrants of each decan, of each story that goes across the sky, God painted the gospel. Even as early as the 1700s, one of the members of the British Royal Academy of Science wrote a marvelous book of which I have a copy, The Gospel in the Stars. Wonderful book about how that God gave us the gospel even through the stars. And then he said, well, let me give you the prophets. I'll speak to the prophets and they'll tell you what I'm saying. And they did. And we have such major prophets, and we call them major or minor based on the size of the book, not the importance of their message. Uh, we have such prophets as Isaiah. Wow. 
heavy. If you've ever read the book of Isaiah, everything you want to know about the future is there in the book of Isaiah. Powerful, powerful uh, book. Daniel, same thing. And we could go on down through, and God spoke to and through the prophets. That was nice. The Old Testament people learned about God through the prophets. His chosen people. That's good. Still not God being with you. You understand what I'm saying? Then he even came in the Old Testament in what theologians call theophanies. Simply meant Old Testament appearances of Jesus Christ. Of which there were several. Old Testament appearances where the second person of the Trinity came and met with people. All of that took place in the Old Testament. When God wanted to tell the Old Testament people that he loved them, that's what he did. But he didn't inhabit them. He didn't walk with them in the fullest sense that God is speaking about through Christ. He didn't do that in the Old Testament. He's done that with you. Do you know that as a church, as the church body, you are a magnificently blessed people? God lives with you and God lives in you. God lives in you. God lives in you. Wow. And, he, and the author goes on to say, but now in these final days, from when Christ came on in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you don't get all the meaning from that. Let me explain a little bit about what that means. It means that he sent his Son from heaven to walk with man and talk with man and that the second person of the Trinity, God, the, the Son, would be with man in a way he had never been with man before. He would speak to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. Although God unveiled himself partially, many times and in many ways to the Old Testament Jews. It was always temporary and it was always transient. Meaning it would come here but wasn't over here. It wasn't universal. Is that amazing? You think about how you are blessed. It was always temporary, always transient. What do I mean by that? Look at this. The Bible says God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. But do you know what? When he was done walking with them and talking with them, he went home to heaven. It's a crazy thing. <laughs> he went home to heaven. He'd come down in the cool of the evening, talk with Adam and Eve, walk with him, love on them, and then go back up to heaven. He didn't stay with them. He talked with and appeared to Abraham on several occasions. One was at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, where he and Lot were there. And the Old Testament, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, appeared to Abraham. Walked with him, talked with him. Abraham fixed him a meal. And when he was done, he went back to heaven. Are you beginning to see what I'm telling you? You have something today in the 21st century that the Old Testament Jews would have loved to have had. An indwelling presence of God who was with you, who never left you. Abraham appeared, or excuse me, God appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai when he gave uh, him the tablets, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. He appeared to Isaiah in chapter 1. Didn't he? 
He saw him in the temple. And he literally, Isaiah became undone, he said. I am, I am undone to have seen God. But when he was done revealing himself to Isaiah, he went home to heaven. Whoa. In the New Testament, God sent his son, whose name is Jesus Christ, all right. And the Son became incarnate. That simply means He put on flesh. The book of Galatians tells us that God is a spirit, and they who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So if God is a spirit, how did Jesus become a man? He became incarnate. The mystery of conception alone blows my mind. But then when you think of God with no human father becoming a human being within the womb of Mary, God becoming man. God dwelling with man. And so, putting on flesh, he became an infant. Imagine Mary and Joseph loving the Son of God. And then he went on to become an adolescent. Any of you remember your adolescent years? <laughs> Pray for parents with adolescents. <laughs> Those are some tough times. And you see that reflected a little bit with Jesus. As the family goes to Jerusalem and they lose the Messiah. Not for one hour, not for three hours, not for one day, not for th but ultimately for three days. They lose the Messiah. And when they finally see him and find him, having gone back to find him, you know, parents, nobody's perfect as a parent, not even Joseph and Mary. And as they find him, they say to him, Son, what were you doing? And he said, Don't you know i got to be about my father's business? I was back in the temple. He was literally teaching the teachers of the temple. That's what he was doing at 12 years of age. And then he grew beyond from... from Adolescence to adulthood, and at 30 years of age, he entered the ministry, began his earthly ministry. And it only lasted three years, and at the end of that period, after his death, burial, and resurrection, he turns to man as he's about to leave, and what does he say? Remember, he didn't do this with the Israelites. What did he say to them? I will, this is part of the Great Commission. I will be with you. What's he say? I will be what? With you. There's that prepositional phrase that we've heard multiple times. I will be with you. Now and then when you're going through a hard time. I will be with you when you're lonely, but I can't be there all the time, you know. I will be with you always. Okay, was that just for that generation? Uh-uh. I will be with you always, even until the end of the aeon, or eon is the word there in the Greek, it means until the end of the age. We're still in that age. God is still saying to you and me, I will be with you forever and ever and ever. Under every circumstance, in every trial, forever, I will be with you. Matthew 28, 26. <clears throat> Hang on here. He never fulfilled that promise to the Jews of being with them in the sense that he has with the church. Only to you and I as New Testament believers. 
Out of all the Hebrew names of God, there are Hebrew compound names of God. You Shout out a couple of compound Hebrew names of God. You know them. Jehovah is the first compound. You take Jehovah and you put it together with other names and you get... Jehovah Rapha, which means what? The Lord who heals. Or literally, the Lord my healer. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who is my provider. What's that? Adonai. He is the Lord. He's our Lord. But my, one of my all-time favorites is this one. Jehovah Shemach. Jehovah Shemach. And it literally means, and it's first used in Ezekiel, by the way, chapter 28 and verse 35. He is saying to Ezekiel and to the Jews, finish up this temple. There was Ezekiel's temple. They built the tabernacle in the desert, and, and there was Solomon's, and now they're building Ezekiel's temple. And in the midst of Ezekiel's temple, the building of it, God turns to them and says this, marvelous. I'll bet they were thrilled. He says, when you finish building this temple, I want you to call the name of that temple Jehovah Shemach. God is there. In the midst of whatever you're going through, Jehovah Shemach. You're going through medical crises one after another, Jehovah Shemach. The Lord is there with you. But the meaning of that would be that God would be within the walls of that temple. I'm so glad we're not constrained by that today, John. God's not just in the walls of the Portland Congregational Church or the churches in this community. What that meant to the Jews was when they walked out of the temple, they left God in the temple. The Shekinah glory of God was over the altar, and there God was. And if they wanted the intense presence of God, they had to go to the temple. Can I remind you, you are the temple? That's what the New Testament says. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? He is, your body is the temple of God. So now you don't come to the temple to see the presence of God. You are the temple where the presence of God dwells under every scenario, every situation in your life. And he tells us in the New Testament, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That doesn't sound like a temporary residence, does it? I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I am Jehovah Shemach. Think about this. It's the next to the last slide. This is to leave you thinking. We won't spend a long time here. I hear the kids today, the young kids, young teenagers, talking about, yeah, I'm with so-and-so. You go on Facebook, and under their status it says, uh, I'm with so-and-so. I'm in a relationship with so-and-so. What does that assume? That assumes that there is an unqualified commitment to that person. When I married Cheryl 46 years ago, she assumed it was an unqualified commitment. You know what I mean? was an unqualified commitment. Christ Jesus has made a total commitment at Calvary's cross to be with you. He says in eternity, the church, you will be his bride. His bride. He is with you. If anybody else wants God's attention outside of the church, he says, no, 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 I'm I'm with the church. I have totally committed myself to the church. So now the question comes back to us. Are we ready 
to make a total commitment to him like he's done for us? Are we ready to totally commit to him? Last slide. Advent. What does it mean? Literally, when you think about Advent to the church, it means preparation. Next Sunday, we'll put a tree up here and we'll hang some wreaths around. I say we. You like that collective we? <laughs> about six of you will do that. And Barb will hang the wreaths, you know. That's normally the way it goes. We're going to get prepared for Christmas. And you'll come in, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, and it'll all be set up when you get here. And I don't know, are we putting up the... Manger? Yeah. Yeah. Hope so. Uh, We're getting prepared. And what does all that physical stuff have to do? It helps us to prepare our hearts for the fact that Messiah has come. He loves us. He's given everything for us. And now he says as we prepare For Advent, Gordon, are you willing to give everything for me? Are you totally committed for me? What does that mean? And we'll close with this. Have we accepted that we're sinners? I think probably everybody in this, uh, the sound of my voice understands we're sinners. No matter how hard we try to do right consistently, we fail. And so we're sinners who need a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. Commitment during Advent means, number one, and it starts with that, I've accepted Jesus. I need Him to be my Savior. Number two, are we, get, are we excitedly getting to know Him? I remember the joy of getting to know Cheryl when we started dating. Oh, that was so much fun. At times painful, but fun. Just getting to know her likes and her dislikes and what made her comfortable and what made her uncomfortable and just the excitement of getting to know her. There is so much about God that we don't yet know. And part of Advent should be I'm just pouring through the Word and through prayer and and I just want to get to know Him more. Excitedly, I look forward to that. And how do I do that? Through the reading of the Word, because it's literally His breath, His Word, through prayer as He talks with me and I talk with Him, and through fellowship. I never cease to be amazed at how excited Barb gets to come on Sunday morning and be with the church. Everything she says, I'm so glad I'm here with the church. I'm here with the church. Fellowship. You can't become, hear me folks, this is a warning. You cannot remain in a corner and develop your relationship with God. Can't do it. The only way you can grow spiritually is in a community of believers. Steel polishes steel. We rub off on each other. When I hear Christians who say, well, all Christians are a bunch of hypocrites, and I'm just going to stay in my home and have church in my home, and I'm not, you know, we're not, we're not having, I'm not against home churches, that's not what I meant, but, uh, but I'm just going to do my thing alone with my family. Oh, my goodness. You're missing the whole concept that Christianity and spirituality is developed in the context of community. We need each other. I need you. Part of preparation. Do we obey what we understand of the law? There's 66 books, hundreds of chapters. I know you don't understand all of them, but what you do understand, are you obeying? Are you doing what he asks you to do on what you understand? Next to the last. Is pleasing him more important than anyone or anything else? You think about Advent, that's a good question. Jesus, are you more important than my TV shows? Are you more important than 
eating? Are you more important than whatever? That Christ is more important than anything else within our lives. And lastly, and it comes down to this, folks, do you love him? What did Jesus say to Peter? Do you love me? And Peter chose the weak word of love. Yeah, I phileo you is the Greek word. It means I love you as a brother. Because he was embarrassed. He knew there were issues in his life that he still had to deal with and he hadn't gotten rid of and he didn't dare yet say, I agape, agapao you. And Peter was, or Jesus was trying to get him to say, I love you with all my heart. What does God want more than anything this Advent? He just wants you to tell him that you love him. That he's more important than anything else within your life. That's what Advent is all about. Amen? Yes, we'll have Christmas trees and ornaments and wreaths and gifts. And, but what Christmas is about is understanding that we're just telling the world we love him because he first loved us. Amen.